Let's give one more hand to those musicians. Like Greg. Need to speak louder. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so the first poem I have for you is I'm Offering This Poem by Jimmy Santiago Baca. I'm offering this poem to you since I have nothing else to give. Keep it, like a warm coat when winter comes to cover you, or like a pair of thick socks the cold cannot bite through. I love you. I have nothing else to give you, so it is a pot full of yellow corn to warm your belly in winter. It is a scarf for your head wear over your hair to tie up around your face. I love you. Keep it. Treasure this as you would if you were lost, needing direction in the wilderness life becomes when mature, and in the corner of your drawer, tucked away like a cabin or hogan in dense trees, come knocking and I will answer. I'll give you directions and let you warm yourself by this fire, rest by this fire, and make you feel safe. I love you. It's all I have to give, and all anyone needs to live. And to go on living inside when the world outside no longer cares if you live or die, remember, I love you. Speak up, speak up. 
speak out. Because if I turn this up, that's what we get. So, <laughs> folks, if you come up, try to speak as close to the mic as you can. We, we can. Last night, though, folks were speaking this way, and the mic was over here. That's why we put it here tonight. So, I'll tell you what. Anytime you're up here, get where you want to be with the microphone. How's that? <laughs> cool? And it's actually pretty easy to slide up and down. So, yeah. Great. And, and actually, at any point you can't hear, just kind of do one of these, and I'll be watching, and I'll see what I can do. Thanks, everyone. Inside Ohio, it can't be seen. White oaks thrash. Moonlight dirts the ceiling as if I'm underwater. Propane coils warms my bones. Gone are the magics and songs. All the things our grandmothers buried. Piles of feathers and angel bones. Inscribed by all who came before. When I was 12, my cousins called me ugly. Enough to make it last. Tonight, a celebrity on <coughs> Oprah imagines a future where features can be removed and replaced on a whim. A moth presses wings thin as paper against my window, more beautiful than I could ever be. Ryegrass raised seedy heads beyond the bull thistle and preen. Everything alive aches for more. to Alan and Evie, 19 years they've been at this, 19 years, that's just amazing. And we've just been all over the place, Hawking County, I'm not sure which county we're in now, um, you know, they have poetry, we will travel, right? So, um, and I'm just, uh, I'm the warm-up band for uh, my esteemed colleagues, George Bilger and David Lee, and I'm so honored to be the warm-up band. <laughs> I'm their best groupies. <laughs> so, um, I'm Appalachian. You probably realize that little twang in my voice. And those of you who were here last night, you got to hear my whole family's you know, history. So I'm not gonna do that again tonight, but I will mention to those that are new. Um, so I wonder how many of you all know about our Grammy women? Yeah, okay, our Grammy women are the go-to women for uh, medicinal, and also they're really uh, in tune with nature and the way a 
of the world and the way of the earth, and they are the ones who grow the herbs, and they go into the forest and the woods and find the herbs. And I felt like I was with a few of the granny women today because so many of the women with us and the men, I guess <laughs> grampy women, grampy men, uh, knew the herbs, you know, the healing herbs, and, um, and they make tinctures and poultices. And there are people who live in the mountains that still will not doctor with anybody else but the granny women. And my own grandmother um, was pretty darn good at these things as well. So I wrote a poem for her. And it's called Planting by the Signs. I communed with woodcock and pine lot warblers today under a cornflower sky. All the muted shades of early spring striping the fields. I can hear my grandmother's voice. You need to put your taters in the ground because the signs is right. Though I always took her at her word, I never truly understood her science until long after she was gone. But lately, I have come to respect her study of the stars, the astrological systems she relied upon. Plow the soil under barren signs, Aquarius, Gemini, Leo. Sow during the fertile, Cancer, Scorpio, Pisces. Plant crops that produce their fruits above the ground at moon's waxing root crops during its wane. She not only planted and harvested by the signs, but weaned her babies, trimmed her hair, baked cakes, and coaxed many a child away from the edge of fever when the signs were highest. While campaigning for president, Michael Bloomberg said, I could teach anybody to be a farmer. You dig a hole, put a seed in, put dirt on top, add water. <laughs> Along America's roadways, stunted corn stalks tip their tasseled heads, exhausted, saturated in GMOs and fusty air. Who knew the humiliation they would suffer? I hear my grandmother's voice, a divination. Thick rolls the mist that smokes and falls in dew. state of Ohio sits in Appalachia proper. And there are pockets of Appalachians who live throughout the state and they're thriving communities. And so this past, um, uh, last February, I applied for a grant uh, with the Academy of American Poets and I actually got the grant. It was a $50,000 grant to create this anthology. <laughs> And this anthology is full of Ohio Appalachian work. This has never, ever been done before. We hear about Southern Appalachians. We hear about Northern Appalachians. But Central Appalachia just doesn't fit in. We're the, we're the, the crazy stepchild of the Appalachians. And so there is finally a book that is all about folks connected to, from, living in Appalachian, Ohio. 134 poets inside this book in 183 poems, and I really urge you all to buy a copy. I don't usually do that, but to support this project, and I hope you will. So I'm gonna read my piece from this book today. I have a couple in here. I'm just gonna read you one. This is called To No One In Particular. My husband's in this one. He's sitting right there. He might blush a little bit. <laughs> to No One In Particular. I'm never happy to see summer go, earth stripped of its finest voice. I'm sitting out 
outside in my heavy coat, porch light off. There is no moon, no ambient distractions. The sky, a Zion. I take solace in considering the age of this valley, the way water left its mark on Appalachia long before Peabody sunk a shaft. Chevron augured the shale, or ODOT dynamited roadways through steep rock. I grew up in a house where canned fruit cocktail was considered a treat. My sister and I fought over who got to eat the fake cherries. Standouts in the can, though tasting exactly like every other tired piece of fruit floating in the heavy syrup. But it was store-bought, like city folks, and we were too gullible to understand the corruption in the concept. Our mother's home canned harvests superior in every way. I cringe when I think of how we shamed her. So much here depends upon a green corn stalk, a patched barn roof, weather, the Lord, community. We've rarely been offered a hand that didn't destroy. Inside the house, the light bulb comes on when the refrigerator door is opened. My husband rummages a snack, plops beside me on the porch to wolf it down, turns, plants a kiss, leans back in his chair, says to no one in particular, a person could spend a lifetime under a sky such as this. situation with one of our um, our justices and so I'm just going to go ahead and read you this poem starting with this little epigraph nine of 18 West Virginia women protesters were arrested at the Charleston office of Senator Joe Manchin Democrat West Virginia during a sit-in urging him to vote against the Supreme Court nomination of Judge Brett M. Kavanaugh. And I have all their names here, but I'm not going to take the time to read them tonight, but they were very brave and wonderful women, and I wrote this poem for them, and this is a West Virginia woman's guide to beer drinking. <laughs> I liked beer. I still like beer. Brett Kavanaugh. <laughs> Belly up, you beautiful thing, strong-legged and twang-drawled, raised holler to mountaintop, rich in root, fed on lard biscuits and bacon gravy. Lick at the long-necked bottle, your tongue a divination, your face a fist, two sweat moves where breasts ache to swing and sway. Unclasp those bindings and all who contrived them. Their straps and underwires camouflaged in carlicues, icy hands groping. The pitiful way you must offer bits of your body, your land, to earn so little as a pine split stool at their stars and stripes table. Drink to the twisted torch of freedom, washed down with fracking waste, red clay dust, the bitter soot of coal. See you later, sucker. 
Say hell yes to the crack and splinter of misogynist pulpits. Give rise your manifesto, each word draping the butt point of every bow. Your body never again obliged. Your song, a rush of wings, like souls releasing. We did what we could, hit the bottles, drove what was left of him into the hollow, built a campfire, drank water from a long-handled gourd, a galvanized bucket. We set up tents for triage, counted his breaths, worry over irregular heartbeats, sweats, Persistent vomiting, his jacked up adrenal system. We waited, listened for a canvas zipper in the night, each long, slow pull, a call to duty, our legs folding over duct taped camp stools, tucked tight around the fire, his gut fucked stories stitched in blood and munitions. Overpowering the wood smoke's curling carbons. Crows haunched on branches behind our backs. Sentinels silent as we wept. We doused him in creek water, a sharp sheen of moon over our bones. Recited communions, sang songs our mothers taught us in the womb. Every neighbor dog and coyote within earshot, barking hill to valley. Some people think they don't deserve to be loved. Every story scratched into the dirt and ache. That week, down in the lower 40, we all got born again. It was hard to say who saved who. So I just have a couple more poems. These are all from my new book coming out in a couple months from Ohio University Press. And this one I wrote because uh, I want everybody's writing pandemic poems, so I thought I need to write a pandemic poem. So this was my pandemic poem. It's called The Whole Shebang Up for Debate. Today, I gave a guy a ride. Caught in a cloudburst, jogging down East Mill Street. Skinny, backpacked, newspaper a makeshift shield. Unsafe under any circumstances. I don't know what possessed me. I make bad decisions and forgetful, cling to structure and routine like static electricity, the polyester. A predicament of living under the facade I always add to myself. He said he needed to catch a go bus, shaking off droplets before climbing in. He gabbed about Thanksgiving plans, his mom's cider basted turkey, Grandma's pecan crusted pumpkin pie. It was a quick, masked ride. Bless you, he said, unfolding himself from the car. No awkward goodbyes, no what do I owe you? Just bless you in a backward way. At the stop sign. 
time, my fingers stroked the dampness where he sat minutes before. Sometimes life embraces you so unconditionally. It shifts your body from shadow into a full-flung lotus of light.
thick with Crisco frosted all the way to Kandahar. Or the afternoon, your farm boy fingers tried to clamp the artery on that precious baby girl near the valley of Argon Dob while her father screamed for Allah and blood soaked your uniform when you hugged her to you as she passed. I drenched that fruitcake in brandy for three days. But mostly, it was the night your daughter was born and we locked eyes across the birthing room and I thought to myself, skillet fried chicken with candied sweet potatoes, fried okra, lima beans with bacon, cornbread, and Aunt Margaret's hot fudge cake. We used the good dishes and Grandpa Oris said the blessing. When Johnny comes marching home again, hurrah, hurrah. We'll give him a hearty welcome then, hurrah, hurrah. And then we'll cheer, the boys will shout. Ladies, they will all turn white. And we'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching. versus the mic. <laughs> We're winning. Um, it's great to be here again tonight. I'm going to put that up even higher. Because it, it really is a, a great microphone that it's very temperamental. So, how are you doing, microphone? Are going to cooperate? It's better. Um, thanks again to Alan Cohen and Evie for putting this event together. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> And to those musicians who are just incredible. 
But mostly I'd like to thank Michael and Heather for the Fritos they gave me. We, had, we, we got back to our house today and there was no food and they gave me Fritos. And I will never forget that. Um, so, uh, it's summer. Summer is just about here. And with that comes a, a terrible thing for me uh, as a, a dad of some young kids, uh, one of the things I dread most about summer, and one of the worst things about living in Ohio is Cedar Point. <laughs> Has anyone been there? And I, I just really hate that place, and of course kids love it. Uh, because I remember when, when I was a kid, this is one of those when I was a kid stories, um, amusement parks were actual parks. You might remember that with grass, with trees, everything was kind of slow paced. It's where when you were a teenager, you might go for your first date and you'd go strolling. Remember those sidewalks that were made of glass tile, colored glass tile lit from beneath? And it was all charming and romantic and, and wonderful. Today, it's just a great big uh, concrete field with these rides on it that are all about 6,000 feet high. They're jet <laughs> propelled and um, they all look, uh, to me, they look very phallic. Um, you know, you can see them all pointing up from about 10 miles. So, this is a poem. It's dedicated to Cedar Point. And it's called, This Summer. The big dick rides have taken over. The coke-soaked acres of great America. Now your death-defying one-hour wait is for Big Dude, or the Tower of Power, or even the Magnum XL 2000. <laughs> Gone are the hokey thrills of yesteryear, the furtive, darkly vaginal ones, like the haunted house, which was really the tunnel of love which was actually the haunted house. <laughs> they were too slow. They took forever. <laughs> It's a poem uh, dedicated my, to my dad. He was a, um, I grew up in St. Louis, and my dad had a car dealership, Bill Gear Chevrolet, back in the 50s, and it was located catty corner from the baseball park at that time, Sportsman's Park. It's now moved to the flashy new Bush Stadium, but my dad would take me to Sportsman's Park uh, quite often. We'd sit there with our, our Cokes and our popcorn and our hot dogs, and that's kind of how I grew up. And my dad actually did. You know, baseball players back in those days were making like the equivalent today of $50,000. And uh, they would come over to the shop and buy their cars for my dad quite often. And there's a famous story, a, a legend, rumor, myth, that he sold a car to almost arguably the, the biggest star, or one of the biggest stars in baseball at that time, playing for the Cardinals, Stan Musial. So this story is about that, this poem. It's called Musial. My father once showed, sold a Chevy to Stan Musial, the story goes, back in the 50s, when the most coveted object in the universe of third grade was a Stan the Man baseball card. No St. Louis honky-tonk or riverfront jazz club could be more musical than those three syllables rising from the tongue of radio announcer Jack Buck in the dark mouths of garages on our street, where men like my father stood in their shirt sleeved exile, cigarette in one hand, scotch in the other, radio rising and ebbing with the cards. If Jack Buck were to call my father's drinking that summer, he would have said he was swinging for the bleachers. He was on a torrid pace. In any case, the dealership was failing. 
the marriage a heap of ash. And knowing my father, I doubt if the story is even true, although I have to imagine that big hayseed smile flashing in the showroom, the salesmen and mechanics looking on from their nosebleed seats at the edge of history as my dark-suited dad handed the keys to the man. And for an instant, each man there knew himself part of something suddenly immense, as when in the old myths, a bored god dresses up like one of us and falls through a summer thunderhead to shock us from our daydream drabness with heavens dazzle and razzmatazz. <laughs> You know, people joke about uh, um, just joke about the life in the university and the fierceness of the battles. Um, battles fierce because I'm trying to find this poem. Um, really fierce because the stakes are so small. <laughs> But we have, we have our battles, and uh, this poem is about them, if I can only discover it. Where is this poem? Where are you, Paul? Hmm. Well, until I locate that poem, we're going to look at, at another one. Um, so, one of the, you know, the great themes of... Uh, Poetry, as I, I discussed last last night, is uh, getting older, and I find I'm writing more and more poetry about that. And speaking of English departments, this is a poem called um, "Because I Could Not Stop for Death," and many of you might recognize that as a and a famous Emily Dickinson poem. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. Um, and so this poem is dedicated to Emily Dickinson. Because I could not stop for death, I have reached that time in life when I should buy an expensive vintage motorcycle. A Norton Commando or a Vincent Black Shadow. On Sunday mornings in the fall, I will wheel the bike out of the garage and stand there zipping up my jacket, putting on my helmet, and perhaps a silk riding scarf. I will pull on my suede riding gloves. And then I will ride out into the countryside 15 miles to Quail Hollow, a hushed retreat composed mostly of retired cardiologists and their wives or husbands, as the case may be. I will have breakfast at a nice little place that resembles a Parisian brasserie where the retired cardiologists are enjoying a low cholesterol breakfast. I will page through the Wall Street Journal, absently nibbling my French toast. Then I will step out on the sidewalk and start the bike as the cardiologists walk by, saying things like, had one of those myself back in the day, and they will suspect merely from the way I pull on my suede gloves, that I too am a retired cardiologist. <laughs> and we will smile in acknowledgement of our shared triumph. Then off I will roar, becoming with each mile less a retired cardiologist and more an English teacher who cannot afford to retire until finally I pull into my driveway for I am not a retired cardiologist at all, just dad, who must take out the trash, mow the lawn, then sit down to grade a stack of essays on Emily Dickinson, who never became a cardiologist. <laughs> Although many of my students probably wish she had. <laughs> Um, 
So if you have kids, you know, um, you kind of tick off important moments in your life by the number of emergency room visits you have made. Um, not too many in the, in the case of, of my oldest, um, Michael, but um, this poem is, is for him and it's called The Scar. My son slipped on the ladder to the pool and smacked his head, blood pouring down his small shoulders, the doctor stitching him whole. Three years on, after a haircut, the scar still rises. A quarter moon, a woman will ask about as they lie there one night, her fingers in his hair, her voice in his ear, the secret delight of him, a bit like burnt toast in her nostrils as she takes his strangeness into her. What she won't know is how that frail, delicate skull I held that day in my hands resounded on the hot concrete. It echoed all summer less like an egg cracking in a bowl or a world breaking than the wild beating of love against my heart. Dear girl who will one day win him, that part of the boy is mine. <laughs> so um, we were having some pretty intense intellectual conversation over at Alan's today, Alan and Dave and a group of others, and we were talking about the foods we hated most. And uh, what we came up with, and I do this just to kind of mess with you, Dave, I want you to envision a piece of Wonder Bread smeared with mayonnaise with a chunk of liver on it. And that, Dave almost lost his uh, scrambled egg when I brought that image up. For me, it would be, this is one of the strangenesses of life. There are so many good things to eat out there, and yet there is jerky, <laughs> and yet there is jerky. And this poem is called, The Mystery of Jerky. <laughs> what I choose to eat at a BP station in Nebraska is a thin reddish brown tube of meat product. I discovered shrink wrapped and hanging between the wiper blades and tire gauges on a countertop above the engine coolant. Why I or anyone would eat this is not clear. The Plains Indians, the buffalo hunters, cut the heart from a fresh kill and ate it raw, hoping the great beast's courage would pass into them but as I stand here in the air-conditioned gas station, chewing on this tube of what might once have been meat, I can assure you that is not what is happening. <laughs> Think about that the next time you reach for the jerky. Um, so summer is coming up and a lot of people um, travel in Europe during the summer, if you're lucky enough to get to do that. And my wife and I and uh, our kids did that uh, a few years ago. We were traveling in Europe and we went, to, um, we went to Rome and we did everything wrong. You should never go to Rome in the summer and you should never go to Rome in the summer for two reasons. It's the tourists and it's the heat. And uh, it was really, uh, despite that, I mean, the city was dazzling and beautiful, but it was wearing. And, uh, you know, Rome is called the Eternal City. So this poem is called Really Eternal City. <laughs> After we'd walked for about an hour, heading toward the Vatican on a broiling summer day, I began thinking about how long the tour we'd signed up for was going to be and how many sacred things would be on view, and how much complicated information the guide would tell us about the ancient paintings, and Roman numerals, and relics, and tombs, and holy knuckle bones. 
I knew it would all kind of just melt together and congeal into one big lumpen mass of guilt and suffering and miracles and gloomy old men in sandals. And as I was thinking this, we were passing through a shady little square where a couple of bare-breasted marble nymphs were playing in the fountain and there were no tour guides anywhere. There was no suffering or crucifixions, nor was there even one important date or name I would have to try to remember. And the cheap red wine at the sidewalk ristorante where we ended up spending the afternoon instead of going to the Vatican was wonderful, even miraculous, as was the spaghetti bolognese. <laughs> How many of you here um, speak a, have, have successfully learned a foreign language, a second language? One, two, three. Yeah. Which one is it, Alan? One of oh, over here. Mine, mine is loud English. Okay, loud, well, yeah. What, what was yours? Um, you remember? German. German. Oh, okay, that's great. Because this poem I'm about to read is called German. It, it has to do with my relationship to the German language. And we go to Berlin frequently in the summers. And, well, it, it, it speaks of one of my great failings in life. And here is the poem, German. I stroll through Berlin, not knowing German. The level at which I don't know German is amazing. It's like I'm here and it's over there. And this, I'm proud to say, is after years of study, high school, college, I have not learned German at some of the best schools in the country. <laughs> I make not knowing German look easy. People, experts, listen to me not speaking or understanding German in quiet wonder. To tell the truth, I'm glad I don't speak German. I have better things to do with my time. Plus, if I actually spoke German, which I have no interest in doing, I'd probably just end up saying the same things I already say in English, like, have you seen my keys, or let's do Chinese tonight, etc. So what's the point? Therefore, if you don't mind, I'll just keep on not knowing German. And if learning German is such a big deal to you, by all means, go ahead and learn it. Be my guest. Just don't expect me to understand a word you're saying. <laughs> uh, so one of the one of the pleasures of, of travel in Europe is is taking our kids. My wife and I have said um, what we want them to be is fluent in Europe, to realize that that life is full of other possibilities. Um, you know, beyond life in, in glorious Ohio. Uh, so I hope they're appreciative of this. You know, they're just getting to the age that it's starting to make sense to them, but not quite yet. And here's a poem called Reichstag, you know, which was the great parliament building of the, the, the capital of Germany in Berlin. And we walked by the Reichstag one day and stood in front of it. And I told Michael a little about, a bit about his history. Strangely, he didn't seem that interested at age seven, but um, here is a poem about that experience. My little boy and I are standing in front of the Reichstag, which is burning and coalescing with rich and complicated history right there in front of us, but he doesn't particularly care. In fact, he's not even looking at the damn thing, having focused all his attention instead on a tiny, intricately tattooed black and red beetle at his feet. A fire bug, he says. And I know he's right because we looked it up online last week. You see them all the time here in Berlin, or at least he does. And there's really nothing more exciting for him, at least at this moment, than to see a fire bug moving through the grass. And I know that the fire bug era will soon come to an end to be replaced by the 
getting stoned and drunk and calling me from jail era, <laughs> to be followed by the buying his first condom era, which in time will lead to the moving into his own place era, which I fear because my own ice age is not that far off and I will not roam the earth much longer, huge and carnivorous and terrifying, frightening smaller creatures with my roar, lowering my great bulk to kneel alongside a small boy to watch the fire bell inscribed with its ancient and inscrutable hieroglyphics crawl past us in front of some old building. <laughs> I'm going to read one more poem, and you were a wonderful audience. Thank you. Um, this is a poem I read here long ago, and, and this is like Dave last night. This is kind of a, a command performance. Um, this poem is set way back in about uh, 2000, and it has to do with, uh, with uh, my divorce. I got divorced that summer, and it was a really agonizing experience for me. Um, people always talk about a bitter divorce. That seemed, the bitter seems unnecessary, the painful seems unnecessary. It's a terrible thing. And made worse by the fact that it happened right at the beginning, beginning of summer. So I was facing an entire summer. You know, you've just dealt with this catastrophe, this, this sense of failure, and there's nothing to distract you. And uh, my sister in California, in Santa Cruz, said, why don't you come out and spend the summer with us and kind of re regroup? So I went out there and I, um, I had been to many conferences before where I sort of talked about the healing power of art and writing. But to be honest, I never, I was really just giving it lip service. I never really experienced that. But I devoted that summer, I thought what I will do is kind of write my way out of this hole I'm in. And I devoted the summer to writing and working in a way that I, I never had done. And it, it resulted in a book book of mine called The Good Kiss, and it, it, it so, in so many ways changed my life. Um, that summer of self-confrontation. So here is a poem about that experience, and it's called What I Want, and it's uh, dedicated to my marriage, 1996 to 2000. I want a good night's sleep. I want to get up without feeling that to waken is to plunge through a trap door. I want to ride my motorcycle in late spring through the Elysian fields of the Rocky Mountains and lie once more with Cecilia in the summer of 1985 on a blanket in the backyard of her house in Denver and watch the clouds expand. And it would be great to see my mother alive again at the stove, frying up a pan of noodles into that particular carbonized disc that has never been replicated. I would like for my ex-wife to get leprosy. <laughs> Her beauty falling away in little chunks to the disgust of everyone in a chic cafe where she exercises her gift for doing absolutely nothing. I want world peace. I want to come home one evening and find that Julia, the assistant professor in the English department, has let herself into my apartment for the express purpose of lecturing me on the history of lingerie. I don't ask for much. A good Merlot. An afternoon thunderstorm cooling off the city as I sit listening to Ella Fitzgerald sing, spring is here, so the air goes lyrical, and perhaps a stray bolt of lightning strikes my ex-wife <laughs> as she steps from her car, setting her on fire to the unqualified delight of the friends she has come to visit who are thoroughly sick of her self aggrandizing <laughs> stories. I want to spark a bowl of Maui Wowie and spend the entire afternoon in my dorm room with Corrine Spellman, trying to remember what we were talking about 
wondering whether in fact we had had sex yet. <laughs> I'd like to sit at the little outdoor restaurant by the lake in Forest Park in St. Louis talking with my aunt in the humid summer twilight as the day expires upon the water and the moth-eaten Chinese lanterns glow like faded Kodachrome. We would argue about the great tenor voices of the century or the causes for the dearth of poetry about the Gulf War or why my father drank himself into an elegy we never stop revising while couples on their paddle boats come in from the darkening lake as they've done since the beginning of time and children call each other across the shadowy fields. Yes, that would be good. I want a good woman with a sweet bosom and a wicked sense of humor. I want to wake up on, a London, on London on a spring morning and read in the paper that my ex-wife has received a lethal injection, <laughs> courtesy of the state of Ohio, as part of a citywide program aimed at improving the civic pride of Cleveland. <laughs> but something has gone terribly wrong and she's been left in a persistent vegetative state, which everyone agrees is nonetheless an improvement. <laughs> and it would be wonderful to lie down with Maria at our favorite restaurant in Madrid with some good red wine and listen to her Spanish caress the evening. I want to read that a new manuscript of poetry by James Wright has been discovered in someone's attic and someone I haven't yet met in some future I have yet to despoil, has brought it to me for my birthday. And after the kids are asleep, we sit out in the backyard, a little drunk, and read it aloud to each other, something we often do in summer before climbing upstairs to the bedroom of the big old house we love so much. Shakespeare's birthday. <laughs> and I'm going to echo, we've already praised the musicians, you guys. And Lady <laughs> And of course, Al and Eddie. Uh, and, but I want to add you to it, the guy in the yeah, background <laughs> who just worked his butt off. Thank you. 
fix that. <laughs> we, we have a divinely ordained right to mispronounce any damn word we want to in time, anywhere. So, uh, that was. Uh, but I think more than anyone, I want to see a few people for coming. There are people here, but this has got to be the dozenth time I've seen you. You keep coming. I honor you. You grace the earth. Thank you. Now, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is I'm going to read four points. Only four. Bad news. <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a narrative point. Uh, it's in again. I'm going to hold it up because my new editor has told me you pushed the hell out of this book wherever you go. <laughs> so this is my brand new book, Selected Poems, my Lifetime Achievement Award, and all of that <laughs> stuff about it. And uh, it was, it was, hey, Jim and I had a grand time figuring this thing out. Say, is this your best work? No, she is. Uh, you can't, but th this doesn't even necessarily have my favorite points. Three of them got tossed out pretty quickly along the way. It's supposed to be representative. So, for whatever it's worth, here's some representative things I'm going to read. And uh, the first one I'm going to read, there are at least two people in this room whose name names are Alan, and to you two Alans, these are for you. One of them is a person I uh, went for a very, very long walk with today, and we got acquainted, and he said, 15 years ago, you read a poem, and he described the poem to me. <laughs> Hell, I can't remember 15 minutes ago uh, something and describe it, but uh, you, you, that hit me real hard, sir. Thank you. And, and how especially for you. So here we go. This is an older poem. They all are. My age, everything is. I wrote this in 2001. I was commissioned to write it by the Salt Lake Acting Company for the Winter Olympics, and you will notice it. I make direct reference to Olympian, Olympic championship. I had to. That was the requirement to get the $200 to get it. <laughs> Ollie MacDougall said, all things considered, which he admitted free and here, free and clear, he hadn't. Next time, he would walk or hitchhike. And if that nephew of his, by marriage, on his wife's side, ever set out in his pickup, half of a Monday night, listening to the radio with that one girl in the front seat running down the batteries until nothing wouldn't crunk up next morning, he would separate his habits from his ideas with a two before or a broke off shovel handle. If he lived to be a hundred and four, he would never figure out how that boy talked him into getting on a bicycle with a John Deere t-shirt and a basket on the front to bring back the groceries from the store on double S and H green stamps day. And I'm sure you youngsters in here have never heard of that. <laughs> that is cultural deprivation. <laughs> you went on Tuesday to Piggly Wiggly because you've got double S and H green stamps and the book of those when you had it completely filled and it cost nine million dollars of groceries to do it even back then. It was worth two and a half dollars to fill every store store hardware. And my grandmother would have rather given me her soul than had me steal her S and H green stamp. So he's going to the grocery store. Double S and H green stamp today. That's not part of the poem, ladies, but but that's just cultural information to will never be sorry for that. He hadn't rode no bicycle for 40 years. But that boy said. 
Uncle Ollie, that's one of those things you never forget how to do, like swimming or making love to something young, firm. <laughs> he didn't think to tell him he had never learned to do anything more than dog paddle. And he knew for a fact he had forgot anything else about that other one a long <laughs> time ago. There he was, wobbling down the road on the way to Piggly Wiggly. Boy, said he was too tired to offer to make a town trip for him. It was only six miles, mostly flat. He sure it'd be okay. And the doctor said he thought he ought to be getting some exercise anyway. It might have been a red letter day, he said, except half a mile down the road. Here come Coach Bing Bingham from the high school in his fresh washed car that morning, taking it out to dry and show off. Said, what's that bicycle you're riding? Ollie said, it's my nephew's by marriage on my wife's side. He said, I can see that, it's a red one. Ollie said, where are you going to on it? Ollie said, to Piggly Wiggly, if I can make it that far before tonight. Coach Bingham said, y'all want to tow it to town? Ollie said, where? Coach said, I got a rope in my trunk. We'll tie it on my bumper and on them handlebars. I'll give you a pull. You can coast in the whole live way. Ollie said, not too fast. I ain't much of a good on one of these no more. He said, I'll go slow. You hang on and ride. Tied that tow line up, got in, and then before he started the car, got back out and brought Ollie this coaching whistle on a loop of string, put it around his neck and said, it'll be just fine. But if something goes wrong, I don't see it in the car mirror. Blown that whistle till I stopped. Got back in, started off slow, driving into Piggly Wiggly grocery store, pulling Ollie McDougal on a red bicycle with his 1957 brand new production model, Bonneville Pontiac. The football boosters presented him as an incentive to beat Tahoka. Shining from the fresh car wash like diamonds stitched into a bull's butt. And I have no idea where that image came from. It just seemed appropriate at that time. <laughs> He's going to squatch better. Holly McDougall said he thought he could have expected until Clarence Ivy in his pickup did put a new 357 engine in with cherry bomb mufflers coming up down the road to get home. Oh Lord, in horrible trouble with his wife because him and his boy, who had just turned eight years old at one minute after midnight that morning in the third grade named Jerry Don Ivy that fall, were supposed to go to the store and buy her meadow lark butter to eat <coughs> pie crust with while she finished boiling dewberries. But he heard down to Adolph's Cafe on the way the news that Artie Gill that morning caught a bass. Nine pounds and 12 ounces over to Justice Bird Lake. He said, he had the scene with his own eyes. And before he could even sense, he had his poles in the truck bed to maybe he cast out a tie or two, see if anything was biting on the bottom for Jerry Don, who thought it might be a real good idea to 
celebrate his birthday with both kitchen fish, almost a toe sack full, two good sized bass, and one catfish. Clarence had to help him on upwards of four pounds he thought he was pretty shit about. It. Never did see Artie Gill's bass, but they were all talking about it down to the lake, so it must have been true, more or less at least. And then he remembered that butter said, oh, Jerry Don, we better be getting back home. Your mama's going to have her drawers up her crack if we don't get to the store. Went to the pickup. It was a potential tragedy. Wouldn't turn over all the electric flat lines. Had to follow it down the wires until he found a fuse blown dead. Piddled in his jockey box to see if he had anything that might work. Only thing that fit was a 22 bullet out of his pistol. <laughs> he put it in and said, well, I'll be <laughs> when it worked and the pickup started, pulled out and drove to town at 55 miles an hour as an example to Jerry Don of the law of the land until he came up on Coach Bam. He had played football for almost 10 years ago, pulling Ollie MacDougall on a red bicycle with a towing rope. Came up beside him with the off window down. Rocked his cherry bomb mufflers. Hollered, flip a booger on him, Jerry Don, just at the same time that boy pulled one loose and he did right on Coach's shiny black car said, I got him, Daddy. <laughs> Coach Bingham yelled, damn you. Clarence Ivy yelled, not if you can't catch me. Shifted up into second and peeled rubber. Ollie MacDougall said, oh no. <laughs> How could it be? But just at that second, Deputy Sheriff Junior Shepherd down to the four mile bridge cut off under the big shade tree, taking his turn showing Monty Fay Rayburn how the inside of the new two year old patrol car looked. Heard those cherry bomb mufflers said, My God, I bet that's Clarence Ivy in his pickup. She said, Where's he at? Said, My God. I bet he's racing that pickup. She said, racing where? Set up in time to see Clarence go by on the road like it was Indianapolis. Jumped over the seat back, took out the microphone hollering, Sheriff Floyd, Sheriff Floyd, set up a roadblock. It's Clarence Ivy coming into town Past four miles, going 80 miles an hour. I'll be in pursuit, said Marty Faye. You have to get out. I'll come back and get you pretty soon. She said, get out where? <laughs> Sheriff Floyd called back on the radio, said, come again, Junior. Here come Coach Bingham, wide open his shiny black 57 Pontiac Bonneville honking like a skein of geese leading in the second coming. <laughs> Sheriff Floyd, Sheriff Floyd, he hollered. It's Coach Bingham go, wait a minute. Lord God Almighty, it's Ollie MacDougall on a red bicycle, 90 miles an hour, blowing a whistle trying to pass. <laughs> Get out, Monty Faye. You have to get out now. 
right here, she said, leaned over the seat, opened the back door, pushed her out on the ground. I have to go to work, he said. She said, you son of a bye, said Junior. In the office, Sheriff Floyd said, oh, Lord. I'm afraid Molly Faye might have unscrewed Junior's brains out this time. <laughs> Went out to the patrol car to see. Two miles outside town, Coach Bingham caught up to Clarence Ivy, set on his bumper horn wide open. Ollie McDougal blowing his whistle like a jet airplane and Junior Shepard coming off the gravel road onto the pavement with his red lights and sirens screaming. Maybe it was the heat inside that pickup cab or an act of God just then. That 22 bullet went off loud as a stick of dynamite tore through the pickup seat right into the ceiling through Clarence Ivy's left testicle. <laughs> Jerry Don Ivy said he couldn't remember exactly what it was his daddy said. It all happened quick and the noise was loud. He remembered the pickup going into the ditch and him thinking, Daddy, Mama gonna be real mad. <laughs> bounced off the road into the right-hand bar pit, spun twice, jumped the soft side cliff, high centered with the rear wheels spinning loose gravel 45 feet back onto the pavement, cherry bomb mufflers backfiring like the 4th of July, Coach Bingham slides, side slid, left axle deep, and then sank halfway into Thompson Slough up to his doors before he could imagine what happened. Bellowing like a tornado said he had to crawl through the window up on the car top to see where he was at. Ollie MacDougall's red bicycle turned into a launch skyrocket <laughs> over Coach Bingham's Bonneville Pontiac. 50 feet out into mud before they ceased partnership. <laughs> that whistle blowing so hard, his face looked like two muskmelons stuck <laughs> on his cheeks. Bicycle landed upside down in the juniper front wheel of a windmill, spinning like an Olympic champion. <laughs> Belly flat, on and gumbo, slid 20 more feet up on the two grass, rolled over, thinking he was blind for life or dead in black hell until he wiped off the mud. Not a single bone broken or even a bloody nose for a souvenir. Said he had to pull a whistle up by the string from where he swallowed it. <laughs> it was Sheriff Junior Shepard screamed on the scene one minute and 56 seconds later, 82 miles an hour, locked his brakes and skittered sideways a quarter mile down the pavement until the slew sank in to the front end of his patrol car, crawled out the back window and hollered, you're all under arrest. Don't you move, any of you. I got a reinforcement coming. Cletus Graves puttered up from his place with Maudie Faye Rayburn on the tractor fender, picked up in, on the road, and she sworn she would never tell nobody. Jerry Don Ivy screaming like a banshee when his daddy pulled down his pants and he saw blood all over his pecker, down his legs, <laughs> said, oh God, I'm bleeding to death, fainted.
holding his privates dead away. Sheriff Fred Floyd pulled up, sat in his car, looking out at the slough. Didn't even recognize Ollie MacDougall, so covered with mud, said the only thing he could think of was to wonder, what the hell was a bicycle doing upside down in a juniper tree? And how come Monty Faye Rayburn's wearing Junior Shepherd's policeman's hat? When the radio came on and the dispatcher, Sheila Morris, said, Sheriff Floyd, it's Darlene Ivy on the line saying her husband and son ain't come home. They supposed to be bringing her some Meadowlark butter. Junior Shepherd hollered, young under arrest. Coach Bingham yelling, that little bugger flip the booger on my car. Ollie MacDougall asking, am I dead? <laughs> Sheriff Floyd said, oh, Lord, Sheila, you better get Darlene. Tell her to go get in her car and start it up. Clarence and her boy been involved in an incident at Thompson Slough. He was supposed to be getting metal lark butter, Darlene Ivy said. Mama, said Jerry Don Ivy. Ma'am, said Sheriff Floyd. I just washed that car all clean, said Coach Bingham. My car wouldn't crunk and I needed groceries, said Ollie MacDougall. Mama, said Jerry Don. I can't make no pie crust without butter, said Darlene. Ma'am, your husband in the ambulance on the way to the hospital, said Sheriff Floyd. They was going 90 miles an hour, at least I will swear to it, said Junior Shepherd. Mama, said Jerry Don. Did he get my butter, said Darlene. Now look what all happened, said Coach Bingham. They're all under arrest, said Junior Shepherd. Here, take his you horse's ass, said Marty Faye. Give him back his hat. Mama, said Jerry. Fuck! Jerry Don. Darlene said, Mama, Daddy shot off his balls, <laughs> said Jerry Don. Jerry Don, I wish you wouldn't talk like that, said Darlene. Ma'am, said Sheriff Floyd, where is my metal lark butter, said Darlene. <laughs> Ollie, did you flown that red bicycle up in that tree upside down like that, said Marty Fay. <laughs> Junior, would you go get this woman her metal lark butter? <laughs> was what Sheriff Floyd said that got Darlene Ivy calmed down and Jerry Don in the car to take him home so the winch truck could get close enough to pull Coach Bingham and Bonneville Pontiac out of the slough and Clarence Ivy's pickup off of the Boropet Ridge paid Arliss Jamerson five extra county money dollars to wait out and get Ollie MacDougall's nephew by marriage on his wife's side red bicycle out of that juniper tree upside down. Ollie said he would never ride that damn thing no more again, ever. And he didn't want no groceries today after this double S and H green stamps or not. Washed off his face best he could and slew top water. Cletus Gray went on along on his tractor after there was nothing else to say. Junior Shepherd offered Maudie Faye a ride into town. She said mm, she'd rather walk. Sheriff Floyd loaded the red bicycle in the trunk of the patrol car. Ollie and Maudie Faye in the back seat together drove him to McDonald's where they both, MacDougall's, where they both got out. Molly Faye said, well, she would be just fine for tonight, at least. <laughs> on the way, found out on KVOS radio, I would like you to guess who the disc jockey was on that radio station that <laughs> afternoon. Heard on the radio, Clarence Ivy lost one night. <laughs> Keep him over for a couple of days, but one
was not otherwise mutilated or incapacitated. And Deputy Sheriff Junior Shepherd knocked on the door when she answered and said, Here's your butter, ma'am. <laughs> Sheriff Floyd, Sheila Morris said from the dispatch office, it's Darlene Ivy on the line, wondering if anybody knows when Clarence will be coming home, and if anybody thought to get that toast sack of fish out of her husband's pickup and bring it by to her house so she can fix her little boy, Jerry Don, some birthday supper tonight. <laughs> that its path returns no less than takes me away from home. All of this is what my grandfather, in the course of an autumn morning, more or less informs me. We are in the room where grandmother died, her body at last a fence post under a hand-tied quilt. And before the sun, quite drops behind its hill. I'll be moving along in my father's familiar Chevrolet, gravel pelting its underside like the rain that so far not even prayer has been able to induce. Dusk. At my left, I see the darkened silhouettes grandfather's cows, their heads lowered as if ritual into the occasional nourishment of bunch grass. One, two, three, 
two, three, all there. Each cud in the land of milk and honey, you understand, and accounted for. Let's build cud corn. to read this poem and be lighted too. This is from a book Bill came back and helped me write. He's, he's, he comes back now and then. Uh, the title of the book is Last Call and it's the title of this poem. And that that title comes from, we used to have a conference. Remember older people on here that TV program, Name That Tune? I can name that tune in five notes. I can name that tune in four. I can name that tune in three notes. Name that tune. Name that to name it. Well, we would have these kind of contests. Who can, who can say the happiest word, uh, the happiest thing in the English language and how many words and the sexiest thing? And we came to the saddest word in the English language. And he said, oh, I can name that in two words. Say it. Last call. <laughs> Tonight, moon glow from within, softly, like a candle egg, and softly stars diminish until incandescence washes the dark sky, until midnight's light slick, its ebb, flow, Liquid, the candid universe rolls softly. Midnight, remonstrance. There are those I wish honestly only to remember being gone. Desiring only their presence, lasting as long as my life, until forever, as I cannot imagine living in a world containing only their memory. And you, my friend, whom the gods call into that other alone, wherever you wake, be it desert or forest, mountain or seaside, find tinder, dry moss and kindling, flint, strike, small fire, which the eternity will flicker beyond forever. Sing your bright poem, for your lightning dance. I will find you sooner than later, wherever you wait in the darkness. We will sing together, delirious and off key. We will tell great lies to shame the heavens. We
was a new voice that appeared to me. My, my, in my first books, if you've read any of those, and some of you have, my, the voice I talked through and used as, as, as my voice, the voice I learned as a poet, was the voice of John Sims from Yazoo City, Mississippi, uh, a big farmer. And he guided me through half a dozen books or so. Bill and I did a book together called Covenants. We did actually did three books together. And in that book, I discovered a new voice. He's E.U. Washburn. He's based on the fellow who was my catcher when I pitched in the Texas Negro Leagues a million years ago. One of those things in my past. I take quite a bit of pride in that way. But there was a new voice that came up. He's a grave digger. And he's a mystic. He believes the dead most surely are living, and they communicate. And he listens to them. Sometimes he talks, sometimes they listen, mostly not. But they know he's there. And this is a song he heard tending roses over the graves of Bacchus and Philemon Rojas. That was a Hispanic couple who died on Easter Sunday together in bed. They buried them in a single casket, wearing only what they wore their first night together under a blanket, of course, in the rain, uh, with one tombstone. And they planted roses from the Martin Garden over by the tombstone, and they formed a bow over it. And he loved that bow and took care of it. He cursed them with this song. has two epigraphs. One is 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Probably everybody in here knows that. There abideth these three, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And then we've had a bit of talk about a just marvelous, marvelous writer in here this week. Dante Alighieri is a brilliant and to my friend Eleanor, some of you in here have already heard me talk about it. She said, English asks of a word, what does it mean? Italian asks of a word, how does it want to be said? Well, this is from Dante, and this is one of the most beautiful passages in the history of literature. And I will tell all of you in here, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven until you have read Paradise Lost, trust me, and until you have read Canto V of the Inferno. It's one of the most beautiful pieces of writing in all of literature. This is from Canto V. Amor, Chanulo, Amato, Amor, Perdona, E Presi, Del Costui, Piacer, Se Porte, Che, Conveda, Now, the best I can do to translate that in my Tex-Mex translation is not try, but you'll hear it. English, how does it want, what does it mean? Italian, how does it want to be said? If you couldn't hear the beauty in Dante, then it's because of my damned sorry inflection of speaking it. Translation is, the, and, and these are two people who were caught in the act of illicit love. They were punished, capital punishment. They were executed together. And their punishment is to swirl and whirl away for time and all eternity in hell. But they are together. And Dante calls them over to ask them, what are you doing here? And they tell him their story. And Dante falls down and has to be carried to the next level of hell because he discovers at that moment, I worship a God I don't agree with. He's wrong. They do not belong in hell. I do. Nobody will ever love me. They found what I'm looking for. And look what they got out of it. What a beautiful moment in literature. The song you Washburn heard while tending roses over the grave of Bacchus and Philemon Rojas. Is it true that love is God? She asked, and he said, yes, 
Oh, yes, it is true, my love, but you must try and remember to never believe it that way. And then, do you believe, she asked. And he said, yes, I believe beyond death. There will always be death. You must also remember to hope. And that, in our language, to wait and to hope are one. Espera, querida. Espera. And then, what should I hope for, she asked. And he said, creator and cultivator.